Uh, my name's Mark Way. I represent Tiger Turf, a UK company based in uh, Kidderminster. Right, anyway, so I'm going to try and give you a guide into artificial grass pitchers or AGPs. They're coming more and more uh, required in the environment today. They're never meant to replace fine turf for the groundsmen in the room, but they have got the role to play, whether it be training, match facilities, etc. So what is an artificial grass pitch or 3G surface? The first pitches in the UK in the late 80s, early 90s was 2G, which was mainly filled by sand. And these were once found at Preston North End Deepdale, QPR, Loftus Road, Luton Town. Uh, there's another one I missed, but the issue with them was uh, the comment AstroTurf burns. So that as you went down on it, you took a load of skin off and people didn't like them. You ended up playing in tracks at bottoms, etc. And the ball bounced really high, so it wasn't replicating fine turf. So that was the stigma that they had to get over. So then they developed 3G surfaces, which is a mixture of sand and rubber infill. Not mixed together. The sand goes in the bottom, it holds the system down, and then it's filled with rubber. There's a lot of marketing goes on from various different companies talking about 3G surfacing, talking about 4G and 5G surfacing. There isn't such thing as 4 and 5G surfacing. And there's a statement on there from Ted Mitchell, the development officer for the RFU, basically saying that there's only 3G, 4G and 5G are just people's marketing spiel. So the 3G is the sand and rubber mixed together. There is a, a decision process that involves correct, uh, selecting the correct surface. So we've got to talk what the area is to be used for. Is it to be used for match standard or stadia criteria? Has it to be used for training? You know, is it a case that it's only going to be used for practicing? The level that it's going to be used for juniors or seniors? We're talking about the number of hours it's to be used for. There's certain systems that if you're going to be using it for 80 hours in a week, like a 3G facility, you need a different criteria than if it's only going to be used for two hours a week as a stadia facility, for example. Who's going to be using the areas? I mentioned before juniors and seniors because we've got to make sure that we're doing the correct performance criteria for them and then that leads on to the performance criteria. If it's to be used in a contact situation like rugby then it has to be tested to the correct performance criteria which I'll cover on later. If I just expand it out a little bit you've got the surface on the top which is what everybody sees which is filled with sand and rubber. You've usually got uh, an e-layer underneath that's shock absorbing. You've then got a tarmac layer which gives you your levels You've got your sub base or foundation, 250mm of clean limestone or type 3x as they say now. Then you've got your geotextile going into the ground. Is the surface suitable for football, rugby, football and rugby, cricket, etc.? Not all 3G surfaces are suitable for rugby. There's a massive uh, conflict of interest where somebody puts a 3G surface down and says it's okay for rugby or it's okay for football. It's actually the system. So the IRB, which has now become World Rugby, have got their performance criteria. The system has to be tested on a regular basis every two years, but that is the system. So it's the top cloth and the shock pad underneath. Football, they are used to have FIFA one star and two star that has been superseded by FIFA Quality and FIFA Quality Pro. The FIFA Quality Pro is designed for stadia pitches and only stadia pitches. The problem that you've got is that a stadia pitch has got to deliver something different to a, to a FIFA quality pitch because it's not designed to be used as much. But in the modern day and environment, we want both. We want the best surface, but we also want it to be used as, as much as possible. Got to think about security. Does it need to be secured from members of the public coming in? Do, do we need fencing? Don't we need fencing? Do we, is it going to uh, get antisocial behaviour around the place? Power supply. Majority of these facilities all have floodlights, so we've got to make sure we've got the correct power supply feeding down to the area. Sometimes got, I think it's access to the site. All new facilities have all got to be uh, DDE compliant to make sure disabled access, so that all these things have got to be taken to there. Check your planning permissions locally, make sure that you need the collect planning that's there. And the one thing that's a little bit of a stigma to it is we've got to make sure it's multi-use cross-sporting activities. If you're a rugby club, you're going to have to like the footballers and you might not like it, but you've got to get bums on seats using the facility. If it's a football club, like the rugby players in, it does come at a price. You will need some staff and you will need to maintain the surface. As I said before, it's not a case of no maintenance, it's a case of low maintenance and that's what everybody's got to remember. Funding criteria. ECB have now got a policy document, the TS6, 
which relates to performance standards for non-turf cricket pitches intended for outdoor use and it also tells you on the website how you can gain funding and the funding application route. The Football Association go down the Football Foundation framework and then they've got the document that tells you there. It tends to be a little bit of a postcode lottery depending on how many other facilities are in the area and the population and then recently the RFU have just said that they're going to put £50 million into all weather pictures uh, and to be honest how much it costs, uh, there's, there's various figures going down, but it can be anything from about 400,000 up to 750,000 for a new build, depending on floodlights, fencing, etc. The sustainability and maintenance of the facilities, this is key for me. You won't buy a new car and not have it serviced, you know, you won't not have it washed, you, you've got to keep up to it, so the maintenance regime is key. But the rule of thumb is for every 10 hours on the surface is played, you've got to put an hour in. One area that what a lot of people don't realise is a sinking fund. These facilities will not last forever. If it's, a if it's a 3G facility, end of wear life is approximately eight years. So you've got to have a sinking fund. If it were a tennis court, we always advise people to put a pound per court per day away and over a 10 year to 12 year cycle, they'll have 90% of the money that's needed. We're going to football, our flagship is Hamilton Academicals in Scotland where we've got uh, a pitch that's been installed for 16 months now and it's just been tested a year on and it's still performing well. You're talking about bringing income in of approximately £100 an hour for a full-size pitch, so that's four to £500 every night. That's as well as your own club's training on it and also the amount of use you can have on a weekend. And it keeps people within your club spending monies over your bar and using your clubhouse as opposed to National governing bodies, you need to speak to them to make sure it's compliant because they will have their funding criteria. The last thing you want to do is go down this route and then they say they're not funding it. Maintenance, make sure that you have a maintenance regime in place for once you take the facility on board to make sure it's maintained and kept up to the top end of its scale.